Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs. Bienvenue. Mon nom est Daniel Jutra. Je suis le doyen de la Faculté de droit de l'Université McGill. Je suis très heureux de vous accueillir à cette conférence ce soir. La conférence Raoul Wallenberg sur les droits de la personne s'inscrit comme l'une des plus anciennes et des plus prestigieuses séries de conférences publiques tenues à notre faculté. Over the past two decades, and a little more in fact, this conference has brought to McGill the most significant scholars of international law, renowned human rights activists, insightful diplomats and political leaders, and above all, wonderful human beings. And tonight is no exception, as you will see and hear shortly. We're very honored to host Mr. Stephen Lewis, who is characteristically, characteristically sitting in the audience rather than sitting up front, a uh, very modest man. Uh, this year is Professor of Practice in Global Governance at the Institute for the Study of International Development. And he's our distinguished Wallenberg Lecturer for 2014. Welcome, Mr. Lewis. I will leave uh, the privilege of introducing Mr. Lewis to my colleague, Colin Shepard, Professor Colin Shepard, who is the Director of the McGill Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. But I want to outline, nonetheless, how the work of Mr. Lewis underscores the significance of the activities of this center. As you know, uh, the center has been under the leadership of two great directors, my colleague René Provo and Colin Shepard, the current director, and also has been stewarded uh, uh, fabulously by the current executive director, Nandini Ramanujam. Uh, and it has, for many people here, both scholars, professors, students, members of staff, it's been an important physical, social, intellectual space to think about and act on human rights and its meaning or their meaning in a pluralistic context. I say both think about and act upon because the center, much like Mr. Lewis, is committed to critical thinking about human rights and in particular international human rights standards, as well as to the practical efficacy of those standards through advocacy, capacity building, and outreach. For the past 30 years, Stephen Lewis has been one of the most influential, most credible Canadian voices on human rights and global humanitarian issues, and the size of the audience tonight, I think, shows that you're well aware, well aware of this. Mr. Lewis has been in many ways the conscience of the North in advocating global responses to the HIV and AIDS pandemic, particularly in Africa. He compels us, and he compels our leaders in particular, to consider our responsibility for the plight of victims of poverty, climate change, health crises, and armed conflict. And above all, he is a man of passion and a man of integrity. In this, one can say that he embodies the spirit of Raoul Wallenberg, whose memory is honored in this lecture series. Mr. Wallenberg, a man of extraordinary courage, a diplomat and humanitarian, who resorted to creative diplomatic solutions to save the lives of tens of thousands of Jews in Nazi-occupied Hungary towards the end of World War II. C'est donc un très grand honneur pour nous d'accueillir M. Stephen Lewis à la Faculté de droit de l'Université McGill. Je sais aussi que ce sera un moment marquant de l'année universitaire 2014-2015. Comme plusieurs d'entre vous, sans doute, j'ai entendu des conférences publiques de M. Lewis à quelques reprises depuis une vingtaine d'années. Je peux dire sans équivoque qu'à mon avis, c'est le plus extraordinaire orateur qu'on puisse entendre dans un environnement comme celui-ci, toutes catégories confondues. We are in for a treat, I would say, and I would add that we are in for a passionate wake-up call, and I'm extremely pleased to see you here among us tonight. J'invite maintenant la professeure Colleen Shepard, directrice du Centre des droits de la personne et du pluralisme juridique, à présenter notre conférencier de ce soir. Uh, merci, Daniel. Et, uh, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, C'est un grand honneur de vous présenter M. Stephen Lewis uh, ce soir. I think that Daniel really uh, did a lot of my work for me in terms of introducing Mr. Lewis to you. And in some ways, I don't think he needs much of an introduction because he's been such an integral part of our country for so many years. And, uh, and so I'm just going to share with you a few more um, uh, details about his uh, path in life. 
Uh, Mr. Lewis is currently, as Danielle mentioned, the Professor of Practice in Global Governance uh, based at the Institute for the Study of International Development, and the Global Governance Program is a joint initiative with the Faculty of Law. He's also, and has been for a number of years, a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University in Toronto, where he spends the winter semesters. Mr. Lewis first became known as a public figure through his involvement in Ontario politics. For 15 years, from 1980, 1963 to 1978, he worked as, first as an elected member of the New Democratic Party and then as leader of the Ontario New Democratic Party and as leader of the official opposition during part of that time. Following his stint in Ontario public life and politics, he turned to the international arena and served as Canada's ambassador to the United Nations from 1984 to 1988 and as deputy executive director of UNICEF in New York from 1995 to 1999. And during that time, he did come and give a public lecture here at McGill on his work on children's rights, uh, which was very compelling and interesting. Through his work at the international level, he's been a leader in social justice and global health. He was the UN Special Envoy for HIV AIDS in Africa from 2001 to the end of 2006. And his best-selling book, Race Against Time, Searching for Hope in AIDS Ravaged Africa, is a testament to the urgency of the struggle against HIV AIDS. Uh, Mr. Lewis also serves as the board chair of the Stephen Lewis Foundation in Canada and is co-founder and co-director of AIDS Free World in the United States. He's a senior fellow of the Enough Project, which fights to end genocide and crimes against humanity, and an immediate past member of the board of directors of the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and emeritus board member of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. He's also served as commissioner on the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, uh, and uh, the commission's land landmark report was released in July 2012. What is perhaps most remarkable about Stephen Lewis? What explains potentially why he holds 37 honorary degrees from Canadian universities as well as honorary degrees from Dartmouth College and John Hopkins University? And why he is a companion of the Order of Canada is I think what's what perhaps most remarkable is his engagement and commitment to working from the bottom up. All of these top-down uh, uh, honors but a commitment to working from the bottom up with some of the most powerless communities and marginalized individuals, working against the odds, against time, on difficult causes of momentous humanitarian importance with optimism, incredible eloquence, and stamina. His life is an affirmation of the importance of working with others to improve the human condition and a reminder of the tremendous impact that an engaged and committed global citizen can have, a lesson so closely aligned with the legacy of Raoul Wallenberg. So please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Lewis to deliver the Wallenberg Lecture. That was an extraordinarily uh, amiable and uh, gently hyperbolic an introduction, <laughs> which I profoundly appreciate. Uh, Dean, you're very kind, and I'm, I feel entirely privileged and honored to be uh, delivering a lecture in the name of Raoul Wallenberg, who stands as a beacon of social justice internationally on human rights for a great many of us over the years. I, I should, I think, begin with a confession, which is that I'm, I'm a hopelessly unilingual Anglophone, uh, for which you must forgive me. And I have enough respect for the French language not to do it violence in your presence. So I shall rely on the language with which I'm most, uh, most comfortable. I get a kick out of an introduction which includes the fact that I'm here at McGill in an imposter's role. I'm pretending to be a professor, and uh, some of my students are in the, uh, in the audience. I, I have to say to all of you that I have loved the all-too-brief tenure as a, as a, a prof here at, at McGill. Um, the students are an astonishingly bright group. I have spoken or I have taught at, at McMaster and Ryerson over a number of years, 
and nothing at those universities approximates the intelligence of the students at McGill, uh, for which I, I, I collectively, in your name, uh, honor you. Uh, those are not gratuitous observations, it happens to be true, uh, and therefore you can understand why I get such a kick out of the engagement and the insight to which I am subject on a, on a weekly basis. I also was very, very pleased to see the, the Human Rights Center and the legal pluralism. One of the lovely things that's happened in the international human rights community latterly is the appointment of uh, Prince Zaid of Jordan as the new International Commissioner for Human Rights. A remarkably bright, principled, uncompromising, decent human being. Really uh, extraordinary. And for those of you who haven't, uh, haven't heard his name or do not know of his activities in the field of human rights, I urge you to read his opening speech at the Human Rights Council in Geneva just a couple of months ago. Uh, the finest speech out of the UN in many a year. As a matter of fact, it's hard to believe uh, that he's part of multilateralism. The speech was so intelligent, compassionate, and decent, and, and therefore uh, uh, suffused with uh, insight that is not normally given to the, uh, to the bureaucratic mortals who occupy the citadels of power in, uh, in New York. But I shall get to them shortly. Um, so I am in every sense tickled to be here and most pleased that you will grant me this time. I usually speak extempore, uh, but I actually took the time to write my remarks because some of them, particularly in the latter portion, may be sufficiently incendiary that I wanted them uh, firmly on paper uh, rather than uh, elicit a lawsuit uh, when I am myself given to rhetorical excess. Allow me to begin in somewhat unorthodox fashion. I fully intended, and still intend, to relate this lecture to the use of the principle of immunity in international affairs and to the inevitable human rights implications. I had originally intended uh, to focus on the end of immunity for sexual violence committed by United Nations peacekeepers, that's a theme dear to the heart of AIDS Free World, a, an NGO that I co-direct, and a theme that we explored with a number of Canadian and international experts in a week-long workshop convened here at McGill a month ago under the auspices of the Institute for the Study of International Development. Indeed, uh, Frederick Magret is uh, of this distinguished law school, was one of the expert participants and has kindly agreed to uh, deal with the question and answer period, lest some of you be inappropriately boisterous after I have concluded my remarks. But something happened on the designated road to immunity. I read extensively about Haiti and cholera and the UN use of immunity to avoid responsibility. And at the workshop, I had been fortunate enough to talk with Beatrice Lindstrom of the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti. And the more I learned, the more agitated I became. The subject wasn't unfamiliar to me. I had touched on it publicly in the past. But the details left me reeling. The upshot is that if I don't disgorge my views this evening on Haiti, cholera, immunity, and the UN, I shall have an intellectual meltdown. There is, of course, a caveat. This is a law school. I'm not a lawyer. In fact, I dropped out of two eminent law schools in the course of a hapless academic career. I, I'm always bemused by this business of the honorary degrees. I actually attended four post-secondary institutions of celebrated higher learning over an infinite number of years and managed never but ever to acquire a degree. Um, <laughs> I, I therefore have spent my entire adult life shamelessly lusting after honorary degrees uh, to achieve through the back door what was denied me through the front. And as I've told my class, I have a remarkable strategy which works every time. I ask for them. <laughs> I, I, I find some auspicious and eminent personality in the audience who has access to the, to the uh, corridors of power and I say, surely you don't want me to leave the university without promising a return to receive an honorary degree. And they're so taken aback by the presumption, the, the, the absurdity of the request, that they usually comply. And thus I have accumulated this extraordinary realm of, uh, of certificates. 
I dropped out of two eminent law schools in the course of a hapless academic career. I'm going to try to reconnoiter some legal issues as best I can. I simply ask you to let the milk of human kindness flow through your veins in the event of any excruciating errors or aberrations. On Thursday morning, October 23rd, 10 a.m., I sat in the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, the magnificent Thurgood Marshall Federal Judiciary Building in Manhattan, along with my co-director and deputy director from AIDS Free World. We were there to witness a significant moment in legal history. For the first time, the United Nations responsibility for the cholera epidemic in Haiti was being debated in a court of law. The background is both uncontested and appalling in equal measure. In October of 2010, a short nine months after the horrendous earthquake, an epidemic of cholera burst upon Haiti. Within days and weeks, the numbers of deaths and the astronomic numbers of those who fell ill amounted to a staggering compilation of human misery. If I may provide an unsettling analogy, the extent of the tragedy of cholera exceeded the current tragedy of Ebola. Since the 2010 outbreak, there have been a total of 706,862 cases and 8,584 deaths. Even in 2014, there are 1,000 new cases every month. In his remarkable recently published book, How Human Rights Can Build Haiti, Fran Quigley provides this description, quote, in both its origins and its effects, cholera is a decidedly foul disease. The process starts when feces-contaminated water carries the bacterium Vibrio cholera. The resulting infection causes acute watery diarrhea in the afflicted, thereby spreading its pathogen with ruthless, disgusting proficiency. Left untreated, the diarrhea caused by cholera quickly drains the body and can cause death within hours. Extremely virulent, and with a short incubation period of two hours to five days, cholera moves quickly. In scholarly articles and white papers describing the course of cholera in Haiti, academic and scientific terminology invariably gives way to the adjective explosive. The term is used to describe both the disease outbreak and the debilitating diarrhea suffered by its victims." Close quote. The court proceedings were straightforward, dealing with a class action filed back in October of 2013. To use the words of the presiding judge at the outset, quote, plaintiffs allege that the United Nations and entities affiliated with the United Nations caused a cholera epidemic beginning in October of 2010 in Haiti, and they bring claims for negligence and related claims against the United Nations and associated entities and individuals of the United Nations. They have sought to serve those entities, the defendants. The entities the judge refers to are the UN peacekeepers. He continued, the United Nations defendants have resisted service, and we are here for oral argument really on just the issue of whether this court should deem service to have been made, and the related issue of whether the action should be dismissed on the ground of United Nations immunity. That is, under the applicable legal governing authorities, whether the United Nations and other defendants are immune both from service and from the lawsuit itself. Now, I want to spend a little time on the legal exchanges because this is a law school and I assume there are some here at least who live in a romantic tryst with the law. I shall not torture you extensively with endless quotes reflecting my legal naivete, but please bear with me as I attempt to convey the issues and the arguments. The counsel for the plaintiff was Beatrice Lindstrom of the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti. She was supported by Brian Concanon, who actually heads the institute. Beatrice Lindstrom proved an impressive and formidable lawyer. Allow me to digress for a moment. The Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti and its Haitian-based partner called BAI, Bureau des Avocats Internationaux, headed by Mario Joseph, have been the two leading advocacy organizations attempting to extract justice from the United Nations. They've been at it, never daunted, for years. To read about them and their work is to read about organizations of uncompromising principle with an unswerving commitment to human rights. 
They draw upon the support of tremendous numbers of Haitian citizens. That support is built on a bedrock of trust. Digression complete. To this novice observer, the case hinged on two arguments. There is a UN Convention on Privileges and Immunities that dates back to 1946. Article 2, Section 2 reads, The United Nations, its property and assets, wherever located, and by whomsoever held, shall enjoy immunity from every form of legal process, except insofar as in any particular case it has expressly waived its immunity. It clearly had not waived its immunity in this case. Juxtaposed with Article 2 is Article 8, entitled Settlement of Disputes. Section 29 under this article reads, the United Nations shall make provisions for appropriate modes of settlement, A, of disputes arising out of contracts or other disputes of a private law character to which the United Nations is a party, or B, disputes involving any official of the United Nations who by reason of his official position enjoys immunity if immunity has not been waived by the Secretary General. In simplest terms, and terms which, on the face of it, seem to engage the intention of the judge, the attention of the judge, Beatrice Lindstrom argued that since the United Nations was completely unresponsive to Section 29, never made any effort whatsoever to settle, modes of settlement had never been offered, it had so completely breached the contractual understanding of the Convention that immunity was forfeit. Why talk about immunity when you have completely breached the meaning of the section of settlement. Apart from the fact that section 29 uses the verb shall institute a mode of settlement, there is also the supportive application of what is called the status of forces agreement, known as SOFA, with the country where the peacekeepers are to be stationed, or the host country as it's formally known. Thus you have the, and this is an actual title, Agreement between the United Nations and the Government of Haiti concerning the status of the United Nations operation in Haiti. In 2004, lasting to the present day, and just extended, I notice, today to October of 2015, the United Nations established the UN Stabilization Mission in Haiti, known by the acronym MINUSTA. Paragraph 54 of the Status of Forces Agreement reads, third party claims for property loss or damage and for personal injury, illness or death arising from or directly attributable to MINUSTA, which cannot be settled through the internal procedures of the United Nations, shall be settled by the United Nations in the manner provided for in paragraph 55 of the present agreement. And what does paragraph 55 say? I quote, any dispute or claim of a private law character not resulting from the operational necessity of MINUSTA and contaminating waterways was not part of the operational necessity of MINUSTA to which MINUSTA or any member thereof is a party and over which the courts of Haiti do not have jurisdiction and they don't have jurisdiction in this instance shall be settled by a standing claims commission to be established for that purpose. In a nutshell, Beatrice Lindstrom argued that the combination of Section 29 of the Convention on Modes of Settlement and Paragraph 55 of the Status of Forces Agreement, providing for the, the constitution of a standing claims uh, commission, that those two together acted as a condition precedent to Section 2 of the Convention before immunity could prevail. If you put the settlement process and the claims commission in place, uh, they precede the exercise of immunity. If you don't have them at all, immunity is forfeit. Both Beatrice and the judge seemed to like framing the convention as a contract that had been conclusively breached. If, as the claimants contended, the United Nations was responsible for the cholera and neither section 29 nor paragraph 55 was ever employed, then the claimants had a right to launch their suit. In principle, the immunity provision of the Convention would be overridden. It simply would not trigger. The lawyer, nominally for the defendants, strenuously disagreed. 
Ellen Blaine, the Assistant United States Attorney, also an obviously accomplished lawyer, put the case. She was categorical. Section 2, the immunity clause of the Convention, was in no way, she said, subject to Section 29. They were entirely separate. There was no condition precedent. There was no relationships whatsoever. Therefore, paragraph 55 of the Status of Forces Agreement also did not apply. There was no point to a standing claims commission. She insisted that the immunity provision was all-encompassing and absolute in every instance, the only exception being a waiving of immunity, and immunity had not been waived. Case closed. Immunity was not eviscerated. Ms. Blaine kept on using the verb eviscerate. I always thought that meant the removal of organs, as in disemboweling. That definition actually appeals to me. I'd like to eviscerate immunity in the case of Haiti. Mind you, let me urgently add at this point that there are, of course, other worthy reasons for diplomatic immunity to obtain. It's just that it's obscene, obscene in the present instance of Haiti. I don't want anyone to think that I've done justice to the legal arguments as they were rolled out in court. There were many authorities quoted, many arcane judicial precedents invoked. What I've tried to do is to provide a sense of the heart of the dispute. I should add that the judge is still deliberating. The judgment is not yet rendered. There were two additional and fascinating aspects of Ms. Blaine's presentation. The first is that she's a United States attorney. As a state's party to the Convention on Privileges and Immunities, the United States has every right to be present, to intervene, to act for the defendants, the defendants described as the United Nations et al. But there's an important nuance here. The United States on several occasions refused to take a position on whether or not the UN was responsible for the cholera or whether or not the UN had an obligation to initiate a standing claims commission. The United States was effectively speaking in a personal capacity, not wanting to be seen to defend the behavior of the United Nations, but very much wanting to defend the principle of immunity as enshrined in the Convention. But where then was the United Nations itself? Clearly a careful strategy is in play. The United Nations refuses to be associated with any challenge to its immunity the challenge based on cholera in Haiti being by far the most ominous. Under no circumstances, therefore, would United Nations lawyers find themselves in a court of law adjudicating immunity. Finally, we now know what the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs does with its time. It hones the art of evasion. But the true revelation in the argument of Ms. Blaine came right at the end of her brief rebuttal. She said, allow me to quote directly, finally this case and the repercussions stemming from the court's ruling today is not narrowly limited. It would create and open up a huge set of claims to the United Nations. Private parties around the world would be able to sue the United Nations for perceived violations and breaches of the treaty. There you have it. The money reason behind the defense of immunity. Alas, these days, the United Nations doesn't need any encouragement to do something fundamentally dishonorable. But if its ardor ever flagged at the level of the Secretary General, the United States is there to dictate terms. Both the UN and the US are running scared at the possibility of incurring costs. It should be remembered that as the wealthiest country in the world, the United States is the largest contributor to the UN. And any costs that are levied against the UN would necessarily be applied most significantly to the United States. The fact that this self-protective impulse is pursued over the bodies of 8,584 Haitians is apparently of no account. The fact that billions of dollars are available at a moment's notice to bomb ISIL targets does not mean that a fraction of that cost is ever available to compensate the victims of UN negligence. Those are admittedly harsh words. I offer them advisedly. I'm a multilateralist. I've spent the majority of my working life directly or indirectly involved with the United Nations. When legitimate, I'll defend it to the teeth. When illegitimate, I shall not hold back. There are few things in the last decade of the United Nations more illegitimate, more reprehensible, more despicable 
than the United Nations scurrying for cover behind the tattered, discredited banner of immunity when applied to the cholera tragedy in Haiti. As I understand it, from my own reading and conversation, this is a summary of the facts, a summary that's not meant to be exhaustive in any sense. Between October the 8th and October 14th, 2010, a Nepalese contingent of peacekeeping troops arrived in Haiti. Despite the fact that Nepal had experienced a cholera episode in the months prior to their departure, the testing of the troops left out all who were asymptomatic, missing many who were carrying the disease. Upon their arrival in Haiti, they set up camp in rural Mirabile, near a tributary that feeds into the main river system, Haiti's primary source for the drinking and washing proclivities of the nation. The sanitation arrangements were appalling, and human waste found its way into the river. In fact, human waste was actually seen being trucked into the river. Within days of the arrival of the troops, cholera was identified at several area hospitals. The scourge had begun. There had been no previous evidence of cholera in Haiti for well more than 100 years. Some argue 200 years. As the country descended into cholera chaos, the search for the source began. It became immediately clear to the leading activists how the cholera had originated and they submitted a petition of over 5,000 names seeking compensation to the UN in November of 2011. Fifteen months later, in February of 2013, the UN deigned to reply with a response so putrid, so arrogant, so absurd that you wonder how in God's name they could get away with it. They simply said it was not receivable under Section 29, which set up the possibility of a mode of settlement. And it was not receivable under Section 29 of the Convention because a review of the claims would require a review of, quote, political and policy matters, closed quote. What the devil does that mean? It's sheer nonsensical baffle gab. It's a linguistic construction designed to convey absolutely nothing. It's the smart, alecky language of bureaucratic omniscience. As I stand here delivering this lecture, I'm imagining to myself people whose mouths are warped into a perpetual sneering contempt. There is no longer the slightest doubt about the Nepalese peacekeepers as the origin of the cholera. Not a scintilla of doubt. There have been at least 10 expert academic and scientific studies proving that Nepal brought cholera to Haiti. For a while, the United Nations rested its resistance on a report in 2011 from a committee of four experts appointed by the Secretary General to investigate the source, who identified and acknowledged all the obvious irrefutable links in the chain of infection, but couldn't bring themselves to tell the truth. So they fudged the findings and concluded that a number of factors must have caused the cholera, the Nepalese soldiers being only one of those factors. However, just one year later, the co-author of the report reversed herself, saying, quote, we now know that the strain of cholera in Haiti is an exact match for the strain of cholera in Nepal, close quote. New evidence had emerged indicating that the most likely source of the introduction of cholera into Haiti was someone infected with the Nepal strain of cholera and associated with the United Nations Mirabile camp. Gone was the last mask in the UN's masquerade. Of course, many prominent people knew that the UN's defense was both phony and untenable. Quite simply, <laughs> I ask myself this, why am I gilding the, the lily? The defense was a lie, and the defenders continue to lie. They were called out by The Economist, The New York Times, The Washington Post. Fran Quigley, in his book, quotes the Pakistani representative on the Security Council, demanding a UN apology and calling for the UN to do whatever is necessary to make this situation right. According to Quigley, the French representative on the Security Council said of the cholera crisis, we can regret it, but we cannot ignore it. The former head of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, Jean-Marie Gehino, said that the UN must come clean on cholera. Even Bill Clinton, the UN Special Envoy for Haiti, said that Minusta was, and I quote, the proximate cause of the cholera epidemic. 
the independent expert on the situation of human rights in Haiti, appointed by the Human Rights Council, denounced the UN's response. That was in 2012. His successor, writing in February of this year, said, quote, the diplomatic difficulties surrounding this issue must be overcome in order to assure the Haitian people that the epidemic will be halted as soon as possible and that full reparation for damages will be provided. Close quote. Full reparation for damages. That must have induced traumatic apoplexy on the 38th floor of the UN, the celestial confines of the Secretary General. But the independent expert went further. Quote, if necessary, he said, those responsible for the tragedy should be punished in accordance with international human rights and humanitarian law. At the sound of those words, the traumatic apoplexy probably morphed into cardiac arrest. In fact, there's an interesting sidebar here of a personal kind. The nominal boss of the independent experts was the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, at the time, Navi Pile of South Africa. At the height of the controversy, she was quoted as saying that, and this was so unusual, she stands by the call that those who suffered as a result of that cholera be provided with compensation. The International Commissioner for Human Rights. Ironically, at that very moment I was about to do a CBC interview on cholera, so I immediately put in a call to Navi Pile, whom I knew not long before we were on a panel together in Geneva. She was allegedly unavailable. Finally, we reached her personal assistant. On December the 4th, 2013, at 10.02 a.m., my executive assistant, who conveys messages with impeccable perfection, wrote me an email as follows, quote, I just received a call from the personal assistant to the High Commissioner. She conveyed the following message. The High Commissioner sends her greetings. However, she will not be able to speak with you on the subject of Haiti. She's happy to speak to you about issues of human rights, but a conversation about Haiti needs to be dealt with by the Executive Office of the Secretary General. Navi Pile told the truth. She was the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. She was muzzled by the bureaucratic hierarchy. The paranoia and prevarication of the UN had silenced even the most senior official in the human rights establishment. The appalling truth about the behavior, I should really use the word malfeasance, of the UN was and continues to be its refusal at every step of the way to institute the Standing Claims Commission mandated in paragraph 55 of the Status of Forces Agreement flowing logically from section 29 of the Convention. There have been a total of 32 of these agreements, that is to say Status of Forces Agreements, where a Standing Claims Commission could have been launched. Not once did that happen. In the shady rumor mills of the UN, it is said that perhaps those claims were resolved internally. But because there's virtually no transparency whatsoever, we'll never know. Freedom of information is not a concept embraced by the UN Secretariat. Secrecy is the biblical watchword. The entire sordid saga of Haiti and cholera is a dreadful commentary on the United Nations. It's almost too painful for words I, I, I've, I, I don't want to be unduly personal about this. I'm, I'm in my dotage. I'm over the hill. I'm around the bend. I turned 77 yesterday. I can barely stand at this podium without leaning on it for support. And my, 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 my intellectual acumen is fraying at the edges. But I, but I have to tell you that it's so damn disappointing. It's so disillusioning when the United Nations establishment closes ranks again against life and illness, as I have seen too often. And in this instant, it's absolutely astounding. It is bewildering. It is incomprehensible to me how it continues to happen. Here you have the world's most exalted organization, whose mantra is human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Every element of the mantra has been betrayed. The human rights of the dead and afflicted were dismembered from the outset. Democracy in the quest for justice does not exist. And the rule of law, as enshrined in conventions and agreements, is flouted at every turn. 
Does the United Nations leadership not understand the massive loss of confidence and loss of reputation that flow from these betrayals? I used to be Canada's ambassador to the United Nations. I was such an apologist for multilateralism for the UN that people made fun of me. They would say, is he Canada's ambassador to the United Nations or the United Nations ambassador to Canada? No longer. The stance on Haiti is so ugly that the UN should feel no relief from an incessant drumroll of criticism. I would want to plead with the senior leadership of the UN to reverse their policy on cholera, apologize, abandon the insistence on immunity, settle the claims. But I know that no one is listening or will listen. The strategy is naked. Drag things out as long as possible, shift the focus to long-term water and sanitation reform, hope against desperate hope that the issue will disappear into the ether of public indifference. So a truly powerful response running alongside the route through the courts is to name and shame those responsible and to keep the pressure on in unrelenting fashion. The most awkward component of that pressure, of that naming and shaming, is the Secretary General himself. He runs the risk of bringing significant disrepute upon his office and his personal reputation. He runs the risk of a legacy permanently scarred by the record on Haiti and cholera. The Secretary General of the UN visited Haiti in July of this year. During his visit, he said that the United Nations bears a, quote, moral duty, closed quote, to help to end cholera in Haiti. To be sure, Ban Ki-moon didn't say that the UN was responsible for bringing the cholera to Haiti, but the use of the phrase moral duty was highly evocative and inevitably implied in the minds of his audience that the UN was responsible. The phrase appeared in news stories around the world. And if there was any doubt about the meaning, it was eschewed by what came after. In a church on Haiti's central plateau, the Secretary General, accompanied by his wife, is quoted as saying, this is a necessary pilgrimage for me. I have come here to grieve with you. As a father and grandfather, and as a mother and grandmother, we feel tremendous anguish at the pain you have had to endure. Does Ban Ki-moon not understand the import of those words? Does he not understand what his Haitian listeners would legitimately draw from those words? Has this become a carefully constructed use of language parsed by lawyers dancing on the head of the proverbial pin? Am I aggravated and angry? Yes, I am. The UN is responsible for this mess, this desperate human predicament. You don't use the wiles of diplomacy to share anguish while pretending no responsibility. The advice being given to the Secretary General is morally bankrupt. Prior to his departure, He's quoted in a Miami Herald story, quote, regardless what the legal implication may be, as the Secretary General of the UN and as, and as a person, I feel very sad. Regardless of what the legal implication may be, every word the SG utters on cholera has a legal implication. And I have to say that if this case ever fully gets before the courts, those words will strangle the UN's argument. Let me turn, return to July. In the presence of the media, Ban Ki-moon told the Haitian people, I know this epidemic has caused much anger and fear. I know that an unacceptable number of people are still affected by the disease. I'm here today with my wife to tell you that I share your pain. Would that the pain turns into testimony. As recently as last month, October 9th to be precise, there was a kind of multilateral fundraiser for Haiti at the World Bank. The bank, which is part of the United Nations, often not realized, but part of the United Nations, pledged $50 million towards the latest plan to construct and reconstruct a clean water and sewage system for all of Haiti. It's impossible to keep track of the number of plans that have been recycled. This plan requires $2.2 billion over 10 years. Despite an energetic effort to round up funding, the proceeds so far amount to 10% of the total. You would think under the circumstances that the UN would make this a cause célèbre. At the meeting on October 9th, the Secretary General repeated his old refrain. 
We are here to express our strong solidarity and our support, our continuing support for the Haitian people and government in their fight against cholera. I had an emotional visit to Haiti in July when I heard firsthand how cholera has affected families. My heart ached at the losses that so many thousands of people have had to suffer and to die. I had been meeting many people in many different places, but meeting the families of victims was one of my most moving. Everything, all those words, all those heartfelt expressions of empathy and agony, but never the admission of responsibility. The Secretary General is allowing an extraordinary manipulation of his integrity. Let me speak very personally. For four years, as the Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF, one of my responsibilities was damage control. I learned that the best damage control was the truth. When, for example, we found out that UNICEF was substantially responsible for the drilling of wells in Bangladesh that turned out to have arsenic in the water causing severe illness, I went to Bangladesh and in a public meeting took responsibility. After that, when we entered into a program of helping children in the afflicted families, then marking the wells that were dangerous and drilling new ones, we were taken much more seriously. People trusted us. You don't need the brains of a global strategist to tell you exactly what's going on in the corridors of the 38th floor of the UN Secretariat. Everyone, without exception, in the Secretary General's coterie knows the UN is responsible for the cholera catastrophe in Haiti. They admit it to each other without so much as a qualm. They're trapped by the United States that doesn't want even a whisper of compensation to enter the controversy. I often wondered where President Obama is in this picture. They're frantically trying to figure out what they can get away with, and they're terribly worried about the public perception. They know that at some point they'll be forced to capitulate. The question is, can they take the risk of some court at some stage opening the floodgates, or can they find a compromise in advance? Should they, for example, strike a standing claims commission and swallow the decision? The one thing we can collectively not permit is to allow the issue to go away. Every conceivable opportunity should be used to drive home the reality that in the case of Haiti and cholera, the United Nations has abandoned human rights, has spurned the rule of law, and has rendered democratic principles a travesty. If I were Secretary General, I'd have a hard time sleeping at night. I spent 10 years in the last decade watching people die. I tramped around the HIV high prevalence countries of Eastern and Southern Africa and watched the appalling evisceration of human beings. Like you, I've been watching Ebola in West Africa. Like you, I have noted the failure of the World Health Organization in those crucial early months adequately to respond. I'd, I'd, I'd lay down my life for parts of the United Nations that do such admirable work on the ground in so many countries. But I have to say, when a wrong is done, a wrong of this kind, with such excruciating consequences, it is deeply necessary to take a stand, no matter how difficult, how unpopular, how awkward, and I deeply appreciate the opportunity today, although it may not rest well with everyone, to be able to speak my heart on Haiti, cholera, immunity, and the UN. Thank you. Fascinating uh, uh, talk. We, we have about 35 minutes. I understand you have a flight to catch. So, uh, and, and maybe if you uh, just, uh, uh, I'll give you a second to, to rest. Uh, just one thing that occurred to me 
uh, is more generally the way human rights and these sorts of claims are fundamentally reframing how we think of these issues. I think the UN's response is typically this is not an accountability or human rights issue. It's not about responsibility. It's a health issue. So we're going to deal with it the way we normally deal with these issues, and, and, and the UN has done significant work sort of post-outbreak uh, uh, to try and, and, uh, and, and uh, deal with the consequences of, of cholera, but simply can't get itself to think of it in terms of responsibility. And it's fascinating, of course, given you know, what the UN otherwise does, which is to encourage states to, uh, to, to promote and respect human rights and, and uh, 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 accept their responsibilities in that field. So, as I said, we have about 35 minutes. Uh, we've got two microphones on, on uh, uh, both sides. Uh, please introduce yourselves uh, and, and uh, keep the questions uh, 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 relatively uh, succinct, and we might have quite a few. So. <clears throat> Sam Goldberg, a retired history teacher. To cut to the chase, Mr. Lewis, what can the UN do if the United States doesn't want it to, refuses to pay the bills, and won't sanction legal actions? I rather doubt they would refuse to pay the bill if there was, for example, a standing claims commission initiated, and it and it listen to the evidence and effectively arbitrated a settlement. I, I don't think they would refuse to pay the bill. It would, be, it, it would be a portion of the total amount probably prorated in the same way that contributions to the UN from member states are prorated. But they could well say to the United Nations, we're not going to permit you to address this in a fashion other than a health issue. We're not going to let you address this as a human rights issue or as an issue of principle uh, because we just don't want it. We don't want to incur costs. We don't want to get into a discussion of immunity. The, the, I, I dealt inadequately with a number of things in that speech, which bothers me. My life is just too damned rushed. But, but it is, and, and Frederick can, can speak to this much more knowledgeably than I can. There is a strong case to be made for the granting of immunity in certain circumstances. I was doing a CBC interview earlier and I was saying, because I remember this vividly, when I was traveling in Sudan at very difficult times and saying things which were distinctly unpopular about the government, I was traveling for UNICEF and I was very pleased to have immunity because I didn't fancy myself in a Sudanese jail. Uh, and, and there are obviously times when immunity is terribly valuable for international diplomats. But in a situation like this, it doesn't make sense. So the answer to your question is, I think the, the U.S. would pay, but whether the U.N. will ever take it seriously, uh, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mikey Schwartz. I'm a first-year law student here at McGill. Uh, you, in a sense, anticipated in your uh, answer just now my question, which was, uh, you made a very convincing case uh, uh, how and why the U.N. should be held accountable for the outbreak of cholera that it caused. That said, if its immunity is lifted, eviscerated, call it what you want, um, couldn't that disincentivize the UN from uh, intervening in uh, future situations for fear of being found uh, liable for its uh, acts, uh, intentional, inadvertent, uh, etc.? You know, everyone, it's, it's so very, very interesting. I have no way of persuading you otherwise. What I'm about to say, you can toss into the wastebasket of intellectual <laughs> refuse. Um, everybody makes the assumption that if you take a stand on A, you'll, sometimes, you'll somehow compromise B. And I don't believe that. My experience with the UN is that if you push things to the outer limits, you can get away with a great deal. And the UN can take stands and do things which people don't imagine possible. And I wish to the devil they did. I, I had an extraordinary privilege. I worked as the envoy on HIV AIDS with Kofi Annan as the, uh, as the Secretary General. And on three or four separate occasions, you know, I mean, I'm quite proud of it, the American Cong uh, the well, not the Congress, uh, several people in the American Senate uh, asked that I be fired, and the South African government asked that I be fired, and it was sort of a regular clockwork fire Lewis on a weekly, <laughs> on a weekly basis. And, and Kofi Annan would call me in and say, Stephen, are you confident that what you said was true? And I would say, yes, Mr. Secretary General, I am. And he would say, okay, then I will support you. And everybody was surprised 
that he wouldn't back down. And they thought that, uh, that they would somehow lose things if he didn't back down. He never lost anything. So my, my feeling about the UN is don't kid yourself. The UN can take very tough stands without compromising its position in the future. You're nodding your head. Good. <laughs> I don't think there's any other person who could have done this issue justice the way you did tonight um, from the bottom of my heart. But I would say the one point that you raised about Matherin Pile and her response to your request to discuss the matter is if the United Nations should stand up and do the right thing, why shouldn't she have done that as well and lived with the consequences? I know you're probably friends with her, but there have been other matters too in which she's taken decisions that some people have had difficulty with. If you're there for the human rights of the people of this world, you're the only head spokesperson to do that, fulfill your mission in that sense, and let the chips fall where they may. And I just wanted to also raise another matter where the United Nations was sued, and that was the lawsuit that I brought against the United Nations and oh, the international... Sorry, the loss of... The lawsuit that I brought against the United Nations oh. and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where I worked for about four years as a lawyer. I wasn't paid about 75% of my fees for the last case that I'd worked on. I spent four years exhausting all administrative recourse, possibility of arbitration, et cetera, et cetera, until I finally garnered enough support from the international lawyers community, as well as former judges for the United Nations and the Quebec Bar Association. And I sued the UN and the ICTR before the Superior Court of Quebec, and I obtained judgment by Judge Helen LaBelle, who found in my favor and who ordered the UN and the ICTR to pay me my fees. Like the case of the cholera, uh, the New York case uh, where, that you attended, the United Nations never showed up. I served the United Nations. I had a bailiff go to the offices here in Montreal, and the bailiff was escorted out and told not to leave any documentation. When I brought that bailiff's report to a judge here in Montreal, the judge was very surprised and granted my motion for an alternative method of service. So I did serve by fax, and that was not an issue in my the, case. The thing about, um, and, and don't take this wrongly, the thing about dealing with the UN, there have been, there have been several cases of sexual okay. violence where women have attempted to seek justice through UN tribunals. And it does consume your life, doesn't it? It takes over everything when you're, when you're trying to get justice in these various administrative procedures. It just consumes you. And, and it's very, very hard to deal with the UN bureaucracy when it is obdurate. It's very, very tough. Did you ever get paid? I received an amount of money. I am unable to disclose the circumstances. Okay. But what happened was I obtained judgment. There was no appeal. And then months later, or shortly after the decision was rendered, I requested the UN to pay. There was no response to my request. And then the federal government became involved and requested a revocation of the judgment. Subsequently, the federal government withdrew its motion for revocation and also its separate motion for suspension well, I, I, of execution I, I, of... I don't, I don't diminish your individual case, but I, I want other people to have a chance that they... I'm sorry, I, no, I, no, just, that's okay. I wanted to thank you I, again I understand these things me. grip one, they take hold, and it's, it's, it's not easy to let them go. On the question of Navi Pile, I, I've, I've asked myself the same question from time to time. Navi probably, oh, she's not a, she's not a close friend at all, we just know each other. Um, I, I think she probably assessed very carefully what she would lose by standing on principle in this instance, in terms of the other things she was attempting to achieve and she came to the conclusion that it wasn't a situation where she should resign. But one of the reasons I focused on Prince Zaid for a moment at the outset was because I think you will sense in the international human rights community a change of tone. He's quite special. Uh, I want to thank you for what I found to be a very compelling critique of uh, the UN and the US. But I want to ask for your comments on what might be an even more sensitive issue, uh, if you would be willing to talk about Canada's role related to MINUSTA um, and specifically even related to the cholera epidemic uh, in the sense that 
Canada, uh, as I understand it, in the early 2000s, for political reasons, blocked uh, an inter-American development bank loan that would have actually provided water sanitation facilities in the specific region where cholera first emerged. You mentioned, uh, you spoke highly of uh, Mario Joseph, who's also critiqued uh, Canada's involvement in MINUSTA, the, the mission in Haiti, uh, and to ask if you would uh, call for Canada to withdraw its support from that mission that the Haitian Senate has uh, voted to, to ask to leave Haiti and considers, uh, much, many Haitians consider an occupying force. I, I must admit I did not know of what you describe uh, about uh, Canada blocking uh, alone. Um, so, so interesting. I haven't given enough thought to uh, Canada's role in all of this. MINUSTA was just, I think just yesterday, uh, was just extended to October of 2015 by the Security Council. So our, our words at this point are not going to uh, amount to very much. But it is worth looking at what is happening. I mean, MINUSTA's been there since 2004, and there have been a lot of transgressions outside of cholera. There's been a lot that has happened in MINUSTA. They, they, they at one point sent home 100 Sri Lankans, uh, because of reasons of, uh, of sexual violence. Uh, there were two Pakistani soldiers who were sent back home for reasons of rape and received one-year sentences. There were Uruguayan peacekeepers who were part of the, of the mission of MINUSTA were sent back to Uruguay for transgressions. MINUSTA's had a lot of problems as a mission. I don't know who the force commanders have been, but they've had difficulty. I, uh, let, let me just say, what, what you're saying, I, I shall pursue. That's tr truly interesting. And if I may, uh, there was also a, a Canadian police officer who was uh, accused of uh, sexual assault related to the Minusta mission in Haiti who was uh, whisked back to Canada, and there was no charges ever uh, laid at that in that case either. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and convincing presentation. My name is Nadia Alexan. I'm the founder of Citizens in Action. And I would like to ask a question that's not about Haiti, but it's been on my mind lately. Um, I'm wondering why it is that the United Nations does not have a, a, a permanent army uh, to go into peacekeeping missions when uh, there's a case of fascism or uh, uh, barbarism uh, against uh, people anywhere, like we see now in Boko Haram in uh, uh, Africa or uh, the group called uh, ISIS. Why isn't there a permanent army made up of all nations that would put an end to this uh, barbarian fascism? It's a perfectly reasonable question. It has often been discussed at the United Nations to have a permanent standing force that can be unleashed uh, overnight if need be. Uh, it's simply the fact that countries don't agree to it and you can't force something if they don't agree. You particularly can't force it if any, members of the, any of the permanent members of the Security Council, the so-called P5, don't agree, then it doesn't happen. So while that has been widely discussed, it is, not, uh, it is not acceptable to some of the major powers, and so it has not happened. So each time there is need for an intervention, we scramble frantically to find the peacekeeping troops. Hello. Um, my name is Malek. I'm a former student at McGill University. I've had the pleasure to see you speak a few times, and I'll just echo uh, everyone's sentiment. I'll, as a poet myself, I always appreciate the way in which you put things, the language is so a student so strong, so I just wanted to share that publicly. Thank you. To, to, to receive a question from a poet is almost more than my frail psyche can <laughs> That's very kind. Um, I had a question. Uh, you spoke about the, the Haiti cholera controversy, and I wanted to touch back a bit to the Haiti in, indemnity con controversy. So for those who aren't familiar, just by way of very brief background, um, in, there was a Haitian revolution in 1804, and they got independence from uh, France. And then in 1825, uh, uh, France demanded 150 million francs, the equivalent of 12.7 billion U.S. dollars, for, quote, property lost through the Haitian revolution uh, in return for diplomatic recognition. Of course, they made this request uh, at the barrel of 12 French war warships armed with 500 cannons. Um, in flash forward in 2003, uh, President Aristide, I'm sure you're very familiar, demanded uh, reparations amounting to 21 billion USD, uh, the equivalent of the 90 million francs that it was reduced to in 1838. Um, in the wake of that, 
in the wake of that demand for reparations in February 2004, the UN Security Council, of which France is, of course, a, a permanent member, uh, voted unanimously to send in troops hours after Aristide's controversial recognition in the 2004 Haitian coup d'etat. In the wake of uh, Aristide's re uh, resignation, Provincial Prime Minister Gerard Lafortu rescinded the reparations demand, calling it, quote, foolish and illegal. Uh, so, so much for democratic principles. My question is just if this is sort of the, the UN history, and of, of course I've parse the details for simplicity, but even just the general sense. Uh, I, I'm a little bit confused why you seem so genuinely surprised that the UN could act in such a self-interested uh, manner and at the behest of its more powerful members if this is its track record when it comes to Haiti. Yes, the track record to Haiti has been sullied many times, and I, I, it just there isn't really the time to go through that history of Aristide and others. There, there's, something, there, there's something qualitatively different about the, about the cholera, I think probably because it happened within sight of the earthquake. Hundreds of thousands of people were still living in tents when the cholera hit the country. And I think the numbers of people who died, 2,000 people died within the first couple of weeks. I mean, it does have the, the, the sort of mirror of the reverberations of Ebola. It was just mm -hmm. awful, staggering, and mm -hmm. the world did not know how to react or how to handle it. There's something about a health crisis of those dimensions which one would think would demand a greater concern. Okay. Um, and it's my sweet innocence that makes me think so. And obviously I'm wrong. Thank you, sir. My name is Nida Jurdi. I'm a visiting scholar at the Faculty of Law. I'm on sabbatical leave from the United Nations. I work for the United Nations. I work for the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. Yes. Yeah, but I'll be talking. <laughs> but I'll be commenting. Definitely, my questions are in personal capacity. Uh, and I have my own criticism to the United Nations. But let me disagree with some of the points, respectfully, uh, you, you raised. Although I'm profoundly in agreement that as a humanist and naturalist, definitely, such a tragedy needs a legal remedy. Aside from the legal limitations in international law, aside from the limitation of locus standi, aside of immunity, which is mainly states to what extent individuals can come and try these limitations, who is the United Nations? Practically, what you are respectfully mentioning is the sending states for TPKOs. But the problem is that even the UN itself is finding problems in dealing with the immunities the state insists on retaining regarding sending troops. Isn't that what we saw in Resolution 1422, 1487, and others? States are not encouraged to send the troops at some point, except through. This is what at, at least we saw in, in, in the resolutions for Liberia and then in dealing with the International Criminal Court. So, so practically, this is an, an issue and that is the issue of enforcement of, of, of the UN. The UN, as you know, and you're a veteran on that, uh, the UN depends on enforcement on state cooperation and states uh, present. To what extent that is? Th this is the problem with Security Council resolutions and using Chapter 6 and a half, or what we call as the part between Chapter 6 and the Chapter 7, along with others. With others. Now, the, the challenge what it brings in on the table is that Okay, uh, what about DPKOs also? But there's another challenging problem when DPKOs at certain points where they are entrusted to play a role in, peace in, in, in maintaining peace and security, and they fail. We saw that in Srebrenica, we saw that in other places. Can the UN as a UN be responsible? Or also it brings on the table the issue of the sending states and the you responsibility. Know, you know, um, it's very, very difficult to divide the UN into its various component parts because it's a highly Byzantine organization. Exactly. The, the agencies and programs operate quite separately from the Security Council and the General Assembly. And the, and the UNICEFs can do wonderful work, and so can the World Food Program, and so can UNDP, and so can on occasion the ILO or WHO. I mean, these are, these are specialized agencies or programs that work at the ground, at grassroots level. They make a difference in the lives people lead. 
and I wouldn't, I, I might have differences with them from time to time, but would never disparage them collectively. When you're dealing with the Security Council and the General Assembly, you have, you have problems. And one of the things you should be able to rely on is a very strong secretariat. So when you have a Doug Hammarskjöld or you have a Kofi Annan, you have a strong secretariat that can take action when needed. When you have other secretaries general, it just doesn't happen. And everything is more difficult. But even with the Kofi Annans, if you look at, you, you keep on talking about DPKO, DPKO, if they had acted properly on January the 11th, 1994, we would not have had a Rwandan genocide. That was an enormous failure of the Secretariat of the United Nations, which took away from Romeo Dallaire and from all of those who wanted to deal with the imminent genocide, took away the power to do so. And, and the way the UN works is extremely complex in, in that sense. You, you're from the Human Rights Council? The, the Office of High Commissioner. The Office of, of the High Commissioner. The Human Rights Council is riddled with uh, governments that couldn't give a damn for human rights. Exactly. Governments for whom human rights are a joke. Yeah. It's extremely hard to sort out exactly how the UN works at any given moment in time. But, but you know, if you have really good leadership, then you can attract very good people and make strong and abiding decisions. The strongest person at the United Nations Secretariat at the moment is not Ban Ki-moon. The strongest person is Jan Eliasson, the Deputy Secretary General, who is a man, a Swedish diplomat, of enormous capacities. Uh, but when the Secretary General isn't as strong as you want him to be, you cannot get amongst all the others, the kinds of people you are. So just to, uh, that's your problem. And, and it's right. always a question of leadership. It's always leadership. But the final point, as you know, but just for the audience to know, as it, we're still far, even within the UN system, the Human Rights Office, the Office of High Commissioner, does not have a legal personality. They, you, we are part of the Secretariat. Our big boss is not Zaid bin Raad in reality. In reality, in fact, in, as a hierarchy, our big boss is the Secretary General. Yes, and this is a positive I, initiative, but still, I, I the system and the that. states are not that progressive toward making our work so easy. But look at your budget. Look at your budget at the Office of the Human Rights Commission. You have no money. Exactly. You Only money uh, barely. Now we're, we're, we're dropping by 30 percent, which means. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Kuzi Charam. I'm a doctoral candidate here at the Faculty of Law. Um, the problem that I think that we face with a lot of international organizations when it comes to dealing with um, uh, international crises of various sorts is the erosion of, it, of their moral legitimacy, a lot of which is based upon multilateralism, as you raised earlier. Um, and the reluctance in some part to engage in a lot of these things is because of the consequences to this legitimacy that they would have. Do you think, therefore, that there would be greater willingness to engage or confront a lot of these issues if we would, uh, to some degree, separate policy and implementation of policy or operate, uh, to operationalize these things? So, therefore, to introduce the private sector into making these things happen because when it stays within the realms of an international organization, they aren't as efficient, effective, or accountable as they could or should be. Whereas if Not we bring in the private sector, that could be possible. as the banks in 2008, or the multinational corporations, or the insurance companies, or the oil companies, or the pharmaceutical companies. Not as accountable as all those esteemed and virtuous organizations. Uh, capitalism will not solve your problem, my friend, I, 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 I regret to say. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't for a moment suggest that the private sector shouldn't be involved in more of this, but I have an alternative for you. The alternative is the, is the configuration of MSF. The alternative is to find NGOs that are both principled in their convictions and programmatic in their implementation. And if you can get more NGOs and charitable organizations who are as good as, as MSF on the ground but are also prepared to speak out strongly on issues, you will do far more internationally than bringing in the private sector from time to time that can be relied upon occasionally and sometimes not. I, I just would not, I, I, would, I would be careful going down that road. But I'm a democratic socialist. You shouldn't pay attention to me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Trish Barrett, and I spent the last five years working with the World Bank in Haiti. I was there before the earthquake, immediately after, during the cholera outbreak, during Hurricane Thomas, when everything really exploded. Um, and with the World Bank, you said? With the World Bank, yes. Um, with the infrastructure and urban development team, so not exactly working on cholera. Um, my question is, what next? So if they are able to pay out reparations, if they, let's say, in a, in a great world, that actually happened, what would be the next steps following? Because the presumption would be that the UN would be present to help eradicate the disease. Um, I was with my colleagues actually in Haiti last week who are actually preparing the $50 million project on the um, rural development. And part of the challenge is getting the government to remain engaged, getting the government to continue financing the sites where they're doing the cholera treatment, and also who is going to pay for a lot of the, the who is going to provide the resources. One of the big things I understand why the World Bank got involved in the cholera was actually because the UN requested their involvement, given the fact that the UN doesn't have enough money or enough liquidity to actually start pouring money in. That's not why the World Bank got involved. The World Bank got involved because Jim Kim is a medical anthropologist with a social conscience and because he's working with Paul Farmer in Haiti and he's worried at what's going to happen to the country and he moved in personally to make sure that money was beginning to flow to the $2.2 billion project or the $310 million that they need over the next three years. And, the, and, and one of the best things that's happened, I, look, I spent my life attacking the World Bank so I can barely believe what I'm saying, but one of, the, one of the best things that's happened is that the World Bank now has a president who takes these issues seriously and is willing to invest money in them after all when he and Paul Farmer created his partners in health, they were dealing with, with they were they were dealing with tuberculosis in Russia and Peru. They were dealing with cholera in uh, Eastern Europe. They were they were dealing with the issues that suddenly arise again when he finds himself in this extraordinary position of influence and decides to do something about it. What is so disturbing is the fact that they can't get money from elsewhere. They can't even get it in the short term, let alone the long term. What should happen now is that the world comes forth with the 2.2 billion over three years. We're spending a billion dollars a month bombing ISIL. So we're asking for 2.2 billion dollars over three years to build an entire water system and sanitation system in Haiti to overcome cholera and keep people alive. The court case pursuing the UN's responsibility is on another track. And I think that involves talking openly and urgently about the rights of the people who have been wronged. But the future lies in that kind of investment. And so when you say, what do we do now? That's what we do. We have to make that happen. And unfortunately, it's just not happening. I, I, I don't know what's wrong with this world. Yeah, I do know what's wrong with this world. And I, and I, I I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not anxious to leave it, but I, you know, it, uh, Glad I won't be around 20 years hence. Uh, any, anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, I'm Marcy Giassi. I'm from the McGill Global Health Programs on Epidemiology. Oh. I was just wondering, you touched briefly on uh, the World Health Organization. I'm wondering if the dialogue you've heard from Margaret Chan, um, sort of the Secretariat of the World Health Organization, has been in line with the UN in terms of uh, sort of evading responsibility for the etiology of the epidemic. Uh, Anna, are you speaking about Ebola? Yeah, uh, no, not Ebola. You were talking about uh, the cholera epidemic. Yeah, uh, you know, the WHO is in a lot of trouble. It has, it, it, it doesn't have as much money as it needs. The funding of WHO is now significantly dependent on Bill Gates. He, he's he's making good investments, but the world should never be dependent on on one person or one foundation for global public health, and that's really what's happening. Um, the World Health Organization at the center has never had the courage to take on the regional groupings. So the World Health Organization at the African level has been corrupt and incompetent for as many years as I can remember. They've just, just chosen a new head in Africa, a woman doctor from Botswana. It has to instill some hope. We'll see what happens. But the whole organization of WHO is, is peculiar and bizarre and it, it it handicaps itself because the regions have more power than the center and the center doesn't have leadership. So WHO, you know the greatest single tragedy for the WHO was the, the sudden unexpected 
tragic death of Dr. Lee in, uh, I guess that was 2004. I mean, he was magnificent, and they were going to turn the corner. He died, I guess it was an aneurysm, and uh, that was when Jim Kim was working for WHO on HIV. And then it all changed, and it all went downhill. Leadership. It's always leadership. Uh, I don't know how one gets that through, but one day. You'll see, you'll see in the change in leadership in Canada at the next federal election. <laughs> that that, it, that we'll, be, we'll be much better off. Don't ask me of what the change will consist. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Sure, yes, and I'll answer them quickly. Because if I don't make this plain, I'm in trouble. Yeah. My name is Eloge Butera. I'm an associate fellow with the Center for Human Rights and uh, a graduate of this faculty. Uh, I had uh, a rather simple question for you. Uh, thank you for sharing with us this moment of great doubt uh, about the culture in the legal office at the UN Secretariat. As a law graduate, my question to you is, would you recommend anyone in this room to pursue a legal career at the UN, and if so, why? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my, my question? Yes, we're going to do three at okay, a time. Okay, all at once. Okay. Um, my name is Charlotte. I'm a student at the faculty here. I, I wanted to say, um, Mr. Lewis, that it's very hard to believe that you're 77. I think we can all speak for that. You look amazing. So. I, I, I don't find it hard to believe at all. I, I've watched the years evaporate and don't think I'm not resentful. Uh, well, you look great. So. Thank you. Um, uh, my well, it's question. a pity you're not in my class. Right? <laughs> You'd already have an A. Okay. Uh, my question has to do with... Um, uh, sort of looking at this issue in, in the frame of human rights abuses worldwide and looking at the culture of impunity that we're facing for, for diplomats and former heads of state um, for grave human rights abuses across the world now and what you think, uh, what kind of connections we can draw between uh, the role of the UN in the cholera outbreak in Haiti and, and the culture of impunity that we're seeing for grave human rights abuses among uh, former heads of state and heads of state worldwide. Yes, I just wanted to know if you had a few minutes or could say a few things about impunity with regards to sexual assault. I know you didn't really have a chance to touch on that. I think that's why a lot of us might be I'm, here I'm as so well. sorry that, that uh, I, 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 can't, I can't take the time. I'm, believe it or not, I'm off to Winnipeg and it requires a, a plane change and I, and I just won't make it if I don't leave here on time. Um, to, to, but I, but I won't, uh, I won't uh, set that aside for just a moment. Uh, to the first question, would I recommend a, um, a, a lawyer working at the Office of Legal Affairs in New York? That's fairly, where is the chap who asked me the question? Oh, yes, there you are. That's fairly easily answered. No. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, there are lawyers in the UN system like the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda, the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia, uh, the International Criminal Court, which isn't exactly a UN a vehicle but is very closely associated. There are some wonderful human rights areas where lawyers can make a strong contribution. A contribution at the Secretariat, I've also always found that a bit stultifying and, and not encouraging to, to creative legal juices. Uh, so I, I, uh, I suggest uh, elsewhere. Um, in, the, in the answer to the question here, which has now escaped me, and it was so interesting. The connection with Oh, yes, the, the, the culture of impunity. And, um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's really related. I think these are two sort of separate streams. Um, the, the way in which uh, people like El Bashir and others are avoiding prosecution, even though they've been indicted uh, by the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity, um, that's, a, that's a, a kind of separate uh, stream which is being dealt with in a very, it's very difficult because the African continent where most of the indictments occur are bitterly resentful that this is somehow uh, directed at Africa. Even though all of the indictments are entirely justified, there is a paranoia developing and thus the president of Kenya looks as though he'll get away without appearing before the International Criminal Court simply because he has persuaded other uh, leaders at the African Union 
that there is a conspiracy against Africa at the ICC. Um, but I think that's a separate process which we're coping with. It tends to be separate from questions of immunity in the context in which we've been discussing them. Uh, the question of uh, sexual violence, whether by uh, peacekeepers or, or sexual violence more generally, is a, is a, it's so fascinating because it's an issue that now grips the world. It, it is, is gripping Canada because of the Gian Comeshi. I mean, the fact that there were uh, 80 million tweets on the been raped, not reported uh, a tweet site. Uh, and I don't even know what a tweet is, but 80 million, <laughs> 80 million really uh, transports me. Um, that, that just shows the, the degree, the intensity of the violations against women that have occurred with impunity over the years. The tendency to focus, it's been fascinating in, in, in the course I'm, I'm lucky enough to be a part of because we've had a discussion of, of sexual violence in conflict around which much of the world is engaged. But of course, most sexual violence in, is intimate partner violence, marital rape, gang rape, rape that's outside conflict areas that must somehow be dealt with. The, the greatest tragedy around the international preoccupation with sexual violence is that we're so focused on remedying the consequences of the violence, on, on helping the women after they have been raped, rather than finding the way to prevent the sexual violence from occurring. And that's, that's the huge challenge. And I must say that the degrees of awareness now are astonishing compared to what they were even 10 years ago. Thank God for the NHL and the National Football League and all these nitwits who feel that they can, uh, they can do as they do. It has certainly raised public consciousness. Is someone going to thank me? I am. <laughs> if you don't mind. No, no. I will make it brief. Uh, Stephen, un, un grand merci pour cette présentation extraordinaire et bon voyage.